Okay, so welcome back. Uh, let's talk about how to compute the partial effects. We already kind of alluded to uh, how to calculate partial effects uh, in, in, in the very introduction, but that was kind of at a high level of generality. It was really just, you know, how do you calc, you know, the partial effect is defined as the derivative of, of uh, the pro response probability with respect to a change in one of the explanatory variables if you continue, continue uh, considering an uh, a, a continuous variable or a discrete change that will be comparing two different um, uh, two different response probabilities at two different values of of, uh, of the explanatory variables. Okay, so so one uh, one thing you might want to do here, uh, if you calculate say the, the 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 a discrete change, well then you say okay, so the kth explanatory variable, well you add something to that explanatory variable, so that's like you know, suppose that's education, right? That's that's our uh, small kth explanatory variable. Then you say, okay, what happens if I get another uh, explant another year of education, or you know, five years of education, or something like that? Okay, so it's like a counterfactual prediction of what is the response probability. And then uh, you may want to, you know, compare that to uh, the baseline, or basically. Uh, um, uh, at, at the value, the vector of explanatory variables uh, x x naught, the, the baseline. The, the so so you can you can calculate those pro once you have estimated the model, you can calculate the response probability for any value of x. Okay, for values of x that are observed in the data, or for values of x that you come up with, or you know, uh, it could be for uh, you. But you have to choose what values of x you need to. Um, you need to 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 say uh, specify what is x naught. Where where are you evaluating this partial effect? Okay. Because the response probability depends on x. Okay, you need to calculate you know g of x beta. Okay, there's there's x in there. So those differences, well, you can calculate you can calculate those. So here, if x k is a dummy variable, for instance, well, then you would say that you know. Uh, um, if it's just a binary indicator, then you would say xk uh, would be uh, zero, and then the change would be um, uh, would, would, would be would be one, right? So you can see, okay, what happens if uh, say do we have any binary variables? No, we don't really have any binary variables. Just suppose that we had, like it would be, did you have kids or not, for instance? then you could compare the probabilities in the cases where you have kids and not kids, okay? And see what is the differences in response probabilities. But you would have, no matter how you compute that counterfactual change, you would both in the baseline, x naught, and in the change, you would need to specify what x variables are in those two different situations. So, um, so that's, that's, that's basically, uh, Required because you need to uh, put in the axis. If x is continuous, well, we often take the change relative to the change in x, which would uh, you know uh, approximate um, um, a marginal change. Um, and and you can also differentiate uh, the response probability with respect to a change in a continuous variable. So, for instance say the non-wife income, that's a continuous variable, and, and then you differentiate re response probability. Rem remember that response probability, that's capital G of X beta. If you differentiate that, well, then D G differentiated, that's gives, that's this, this CDF differentiated gives a density, right? Evaluated at X beta, and then multiplied with uh, beta, okay? So this is a density, which is always positive which really means that these marginal changes uh, are the sign of those is always determined by the sign of the coefficient beta. So it may be that we are not really, we don't really know what the magnitude of the effect is just from looking at, at, at the size of beta, but uh, we'll know uh, the direction of the effect in a binary response model, okay? Because this density is always positive. A key thing here to take away is that these marginal changes, either uh, the partial effects, either the discrete changes or marginal changes, 
always depends on the explanatory variables. So, so let's talk a little bit about, I mean, we talked about identification of the parameters, right? And, and, and we couldn't identify uh, beta relative, uh, anything else but beta relative to, to the, the variance of that error term. Um, so, but can we identify departure effects given our estimate of beta divided by sigma? Okay, so suppose that um, the probability, response probability is this G of X beta, um, which is also equal to some other scaled version, um, which is uh, um, G tilde of X beta, where the difference between those two is, is really uh, the scale of, of, the, of, the, of the variance here. Now, um, so if we are taking the derivative of this guy here, and <clears throat> with respect to a change in, in X, well, you get the density of this, this, this other G that could be like a probe with variance, you know, sigma equal to five. Okay. Um, and evaluated at X beta divided by sigma and then multiplied by beta divided by, by sigma. Well, so this means that as long as we can just differentiate the guy and express this in, in close form, well, it doesn't really matter what the scale of G and, and G tilde is. Um, all we really care about here is that if we have estimated beta divided by sigma and beta uh, divided uh, and, and, and beta divided by sigma is the only thing that appears in this equation. Well, we don't really need to know beta and sigma separately to calculate the partial effects. Okay, so the partial effects really only depend, depend on that ratio, which is what we can identify. So in other words, um, the partial effects are identified in the normalization sigma equal to one is totally without loss of generality at least if the interest is in, in the partial effect, okay? Uh, so beta J that determines the size of the partial effects in binary response models because this part is always uh, positive. So, so that's, that's kind of uh, uh, some um, uh, things that we need to keep in mind. Now in the linear probability model, well, the partial effect is all ways equal to beta J, right? I mean, this is a linear model. You differentiate with respect to X beta with respect to to X, well, you get beta, right? So uh, it doesn't depend on X. In the linear, in the latent variable model, you know, such as probit logit, well, beta that determines the size of the, of the partial effects, but not the magnitude. That depends on where you evaluate that partial effect. So question here is, which X should we use, okay? Should we use like, you know, popular choices or the sample mean or something we call like, sample enumeration. So we just evaluate the partial effects at all the data points that gives like a vector of partial effects. I mean, you can put in a whole vector of X's, all the observed variables, right? And then calculate this uh, partial effects for all the observed variables and then take the average of all those. That will be called the, the average partial effects. The other thing, uh, taking the, app or, uh, the, the partial effect at the average, that would be called the partial effect at the average or PEA or a, a, in the average partial effect, that's APE. That's like you take the average of all the partial effects that you have computed for all the data points. So does it matter if you do one or the other? Well, it does matter because this is a nonlinear function, right? I mean, this, this, this matters a lot. If you first take the average um, uh, 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 of X beta and stick it into this formula, or if you take X, X beta, stick it into the formula and then take the average of all the observation. That makes a lot of difference because G is a nonlinear function. So let's try to look at this graphically. What is the partial effect? So he has drawn an example where, you know, we've seen an example where, where beta was positive. So why don't we take one where it's negative? The partial effect here, well, this is the, the response probability. You, you got curved here, right? So, so uh, well, it's not supposed to go below one, uh, uh, below zero. Sorry about that. That's just, you know, making, uh, but it's supposed to be between zero and one, okay? But here's, here's the response probability. Where does, where does the, uh, what is the partial effect? The partial effect is the slope of this curve with respect to a change in X, right? I mean, you're making a change in X. 
up here, the partial effect is very small. And in fact, if this was like, you know, a CDF that would approach zero, then for, for large values of X, well, the partial effect is going to be zero. For very small values of X, the, 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 the partial effect is going to be zero as well, because you're so far away from being on the margin to going from zero to one. Okay. Makes kind of a lot of sense in some sense, right? I mean, just you know, think about this guy who has no education, no, you know, no experience, five kids, you know, uh, all the observable characteristics against him. And then you give him like, you know, marginal change in the, in, in the, in the spouse income, okay? Of course, the effect's gonna be smaller for this person compared to one who's just on the margin to, to go in and, and, and try to be on the labor, in the labor force. So it's very intuitive to have this, these effects. Okay, the largest effects is uh, when the probability is around one half, right? So that's, that's where you're really on the margin from going from zero to one. Um, whereas the, the, the smallest partial effect is, is, is in the tails. Okay. So you can see it does make a, a difference if you take the average, which is going to be you know, probably around here, or you take the average of, um, of all the partial effects in this data, where a lot of people will have zeros uh, out here, and, and some people will be out in here. This depends on the distribution of X and the coefficients and all that, but they generally, the, these coefficients are very different. And also kind of may mean something different. You can say that the partial, uh, or the partial effect at the average is some kind of weird measure for the partial effect for some average person. Whereas the average effects, or the average partial effect, well, that's kind of the average of all the estimated partial effects that we have uh, you know, predicted from our model in the entire sample, which is, uh, which is uh, kind of a, uh, is, is a, is, is a different animal, right? It means two, two different things. Um, so <clears throat> one, one thing here about taking the partial effect of the, uh, at the average is you sometimes you end up in, in very awkward situations. Uh, you know, what does it mean to evaluate the you know, for the average gender, which as you know, half of the population is, is has, uh, uh, are men and the other ha half is, is female, then the average person is somewhere in between, right? Uh, or, um, or, or it could be, um, you know, uh, the um, other binary, other binary variables, like, you know, what is the average squared experience and average spare, squared uh, and, and average experience is that even is that even does that even exist for a person um, so so this can lead to some awkward uh, interpretations um, anyway so so um, <clears throat> but it's it's quick to do okay so that's why it's popular and it's it's often what is you know printed out as the partial effects at the um, um, in, in standard software packages like like uh, um, like Stata. Okay, so so here I started out actually talking about saying that the, one of the benefits of the linear probability model we estimate only one beta, so there's only one partial effect, and it's not really estimating those same coefficients uh, that we have from the latent variable models, but but it does estimate something else uh, pretty nicely. It is a good approximation of the partial effect. In fact, if both the explanatory variables and the, and the epsilons are, are normally distributed, then the linear probability model is asymptotically equivalent to the average partial effect for the probit model. And we can actually see that. So, so if, um, if we estimate, so again, here I'm using this simulated data that we had in the very beginning, just to make sure that, you know, I generated the data so I know what's going on, right? Here's the linear probability model estimates. Um, let's not dwell too much with the constant, but just look at the, at, at the effect of a change in, in this one expensive variable X1, where the coefficient in the, the underlying latent variable model that was probed that generated these data was two. So we're not estimating that too, right? Um, that, 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 I mean, we're not nearly, we're not, uh, it has the same direction, but it's, it's not, that's not what we're trying to estimate. 
But if you calculate the average partial effects from the, this probe it at the true parameters, well, you get 0 0.35, okay? And, and this is exactly the slope coefficient of the linear probability model. So, um, so what I said in the beginning that these, these part, the slope of this curve here is kind of you know, approximating what is the average slope of this curve if you average over the sample. That is, that is actually a property that you get uh, theoretically in, as n go to infinity for the linear probability model if the data is generated from normally distributed variables, uh, normally distributed data on, on X and epsilon. And this is exactly what I did in this simulated data. So, so in this situation, you get a very nice approximation of the uh, partial uh, effects when you're just using all us. So if your interest is in estimating the partial effects, uh, the average partial effects, not the, the distribution of the partial effects, well, linear probability models is, is actually not a bad choice, okay? So why don't we just move on here and, and look at the partial effects in our empirical example. Remember that the coefficients, and this is what I, I repeated here, I didn't repeat the standard errors, right? Uh, here, they're very different across different specifications, right? You know, you got almost uh, twice as large estimates for, for log as for probit, uh, or 1.6 times as large. Um, but the average partial effects, they're very similar. Actually, you know, it's, it's indistinguishable, okay? So this is, this is really good to know. It, in, if you're interested in the average partial effects, these two models are getting, you know, almost virtually the same predictions, which is not super surprising, right? We know scale is irrelevant. We know that the shape of those two distributions is, 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 is very similar up to scale. So why would they predict something different? Okay. So um, there is a little bit, you know, a, a, a little bit of a difference. It is like, you know, it's observable, right? There's a difference here, for instance, but it's, it's, it's not as big as the differences you see in the parameter estimates. The partial effects, th these are the average partial effects. Um, the partial effects of the average, right? This is, I calculated that for, for probit and for, for uh, logit. And, and see here, there start to be some, uh, well, there's some minor differences, but you know, so it's, it's um, I, I would say these are giving fairly similar predictions, okay? Very similar predictions. So it's really kind of a matter of taste. And really the, the benefit, huge benefit of, of a logit model is that when it comes to high dimensional choices where you have discrete outcomes with not only binary choice, but you know, you can choose between not only car and, and no car, but you know, uh, it could be like a car a type one, type two, type three, like a discrete choice of a wide variety of cars, multinomial choices, we'll talk about that later. Um, in that case, you have closed form solutions for the response probabilities for logic, but you don't really have that for, for, for probate and need to like simulate it uh, using Monte Carlo uh, simulation. So, um, so Logit is, is, has some nice uh, features in, in terms of getting like, uh, at least the, the, uh, the distributional function form doesn't matter a lot. It's kind of reassuring. Like the last thing I want to compare is, not, is our, our estimates from the linear probability model. I compare that to the uh, average partial effects estimated by Logit and Probit. And again, they're, they're pretty similar actually. You know, you got 0 0.038 on education, very similar for Logit and Probit. So, um, so, so linear probability model is, is, is a good quick and dirty way to get some average partial effects. Um, if, uh, but if you wanna do counterfactuals and you wanna see what the entire distribution of those partial effects is or see how is it different for different parts of, uh, of, of people in the, opposite, in the population in your sample, then, well, then you need to do a, a model that can actually predict heterogeneous partial effects such as probit or logic. Okay, so uh, finally thing, uh, final remark here is you can also re like rescale the parameters and calibrate the coefficients to have the same partial effects at, you know, X beta equal to zero. Um, you know, you can look at the equations here, but really it's, you got the partial effects uh, with a, for logit and probit being something like this, right? 
And then you say, what happens if I put in a zero here? So I choose X so that, that uh, um, I choose uh, to, to, to have the same partial effect when X beta is equal to zero. Then uh, you get, uh, in the logit case, you get the coefficient in logit divided by one four because the mode of, of, of the uh, density for the standard log uh, logistic distribution is one over four, right? You got zero exponential of, 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 uh, of, of zero, that is, uh, that's one. And then you got one plus one, uh, that's two squared, that's four, so the one over four. And for the, um, uh, for the uh, pro probit model, well then that, that same number is one over the square root two. So and then these, you know, you can try to calibrate the parameters so that, uh, you know, these two partial effects are the same or, um, and, and, and then it really, what you see is that the, the, the coefficients of the logit, well, that's equal to four divided by two, uh, two over the square root of two pi, uh, which is approximately 1.6 times the probit estimate. So in other words, the parameter estimates, if you take the probit parameter estimates and multiply by 1.6, you're gonna roughly get the same estimates as you do for the, um, uh, as you do for the uh, um, probit, uh, uh, you get for the logit model. Did I, did I do this here? So here, the, here are all the, the partial effects, or, or here are all, all the coefficients. So we, if we take probit, um, should we should we do that uh, and multi uh, multiply by say now they're different right? But if you multiply this guy here with one point six, um, are are they more similar? Um, oh, I'm doing something different here. Sorry about this. <laughs> uh, here I'm calculating the uh, relative size of of the coefficient. So here I'm dividing all the coefficients with the coefficients on, on education, okay? And if you do that, well, you see they're actually fairly similar across the different specifications. Because as we, you know, when you take the relative size of two coefficients, then that scale factor is factoring out. So, you know, beta um, for coefficient one divided beta coefficient two, that the, the, they're both scaled by the same scale factor, uh, sigma, so that, that averaged out. So uh, that cancel out when you divide them with each other. And so, uh, since the only difference really between logit and probit is that they have different scale factors, it's not surprising that you get very similar estimates once you normalize with respect to another coefficient. So this is another type of normalization you can do that you can normalize that, that, that coefficient on say one of the exponential variables to be one instead of the variance. And then you get you know a different set of coefficients, but they're very similar if they're scaled in the same way. And that's kind of the point. Okay, so uh, I think I'm gonna end here with just uh, some takeaways for uh, lo lo uh, the, the linear probability model and probit and logit. Probit and logit are really similar, really, really similar. Logit, logistic and normal distributions are very similar as you saw on the graphs, we scale them the same. Um, you know, it's best symmetric, but the logistic distribution has a little bit longer tails, okay? Uh, but not, nothing that, that, that really, you know, flax on, uh, on on the, um, when we compare the, the parameter estimates and the average partial effects uh, for, for our estimations, one day are scaled in the same way. Um, latent variable model, well, requires a scale normalization to obtain our education, but once you do that, well, you can estimate using maximum likelihood, okay? Usually we estimate these models with, with maximum likelihood, but nothing prevents you from doing, say, nonlinear least squares or estimate with, uh, you know, these models with, with GMM or other estimation methods, okay? It's, it's a model and uh, th that's one thing, you specify a model and then you choose your estimation method depending on the data you have available, you have ability you have available and, and this, uh, the extent to which you believe assumptions, parts of, of assumptions are true. Here, if the, the obvious choice is really maximum, maximum likelihood. For, for these basic logic and probability models. For the linear probability model, well, it, very easy to estimate with the OLS, easy to allow for, for, for other extensions. Uh, I mean, we've already, we've just been through estimation of linear, um, linear panel data models. So extensions of this for panel data, for, for logit and probability is, is not as easy. Uh, you can just do transformations and then the unobserved partial effects are disappearing. 
uh, like you know, taking within differences or or or, or, um, or, or you know, first differences over time. You can't do that in nonlinear panel data models. So, so one big benefit for 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 the linear probability model is that it's, it is linear, so you can easily uh, uh, you know account for fixed effects in in uh, panel data regression models, or you can easily allow for endogenous variables um, used using you know IV or GMM. Um, you can allow for, for for easily allow for dynamics. So there's many things that are easily is much easier to do in the linear probability model, which is, um, um, which is, you know, uh, therefore it's, 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 it's not just off the table because it's simple to do, okay? But if you want to do any estimation that involves calculating the average, uh, anything else but the average partial effects, well, well then you have to ha have a model that predicts the entire distribution of the partial effects. Uh, Linear probability model assume that partial effects is 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 constant. It doesn't depend on x, which you know is is very unrealistic. But it gives it gives still gives a good approximation, as we've seen, for the average partial effects. At least in the case where we have normally distributed explanatory variables and error types. I think that's kind of it for 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 today. So. Uh, looking forward to talk about specification issues and uh, uh, binary response models for panel data in the le in later lectures. You know, keep up the good faith and see you guys. <laughs>